Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here on YouTube Live. I'm Brett and your host today, and we're going to be talking about Service Mesh, Kubernetes, container orchestration, everything Docker and DevOps, and I'm glad you're here. So if you're not watching this live, sorry, but you can not get into the chat. But if you're here live, you get to ask your questions, and I'll introduce our guest today in a second, and you get to sort of have a conversation with us. That's the advantage of live on YouTube. So we'll be here around an hour, and we'll make sure that we get to your questions. And if we don't get to your questions, hang around the chat for a few minutes afterwards, and I'll make sure that we get to those. If you, That way, if you have to run off to a meeting or something, you can just ask your question and know that you can watch the video later. So a, little, a few bit of the logistics of this show is we're on the internet every week. I'm here talking on Thursdays around this time. And the way that you find out about those is you subscribe and click that little dinner bell. That'll give you a notification when I go live. You can come back every week, ask questions about containers and everything DevOps. And now we're going to get to the fun part. The fun part is introducing my good friend, Betty Janod, who you may know from Docker, but now she's heading up a, a great company at Solo.io. She's VP of marketing there. And let me just tell you a little bit about Betty. Betty spent over four years at Docker running product and partner marketing. During that time, she helped so many people, including myself, and launching a laundry list of Docker product and projects. Over that time, she also helped to cultivate the Docker captains. Thank you, Betty. And which is where we got to know each other and basically had a lot of fun at conferences and working on Docker, cool Docker stuff for you, the audience on the internet. Welcome to the show, Betty. Thank you, Brad. Thanks for having me on. Hi, everybody online. I'm so glad. We, we've been talking about doing this for a while, and I'm glad we finally made the time to do it. And uh, we, so for those of you that don't know, Betty, if you've ever seen me do a selfie on the internet with Docker, if you've ever seen any of that on my Twitter stream, that is me trying to be one-tenth as cool as Betty. <laughs> she Stop. invented the Docker selfie. How many years ago was that? I can't take credit. I just um, really grabbed onto it and thought it used it as a great way to meet new people, really. Yeah. Yeah, that it... Um, it's, a, it's one of my favorite parts is when it's a first time selfie for someone. Like when they show up and they're like, I've never had a selfie. Or they see a selfie stick and they're like, these what are actually, yeah. <laughs> these are cool. I want one. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's always a fun icebreaker, I think, for uh, people. And now what happens, and uh, you know, this happened with you for years and years, was um, you know, people would show up and you're, you're now, like they're coming up to you for the selfie, isn't it? <laughs> That's the goal, right? And, yeah. Uh, and like you say, it helps break the ice if it's their first time, you know, at a conference or something. Yeah. And so if you see either one of us at a conference, definitely get a selfie. We are always prepared with selfie sticks, fully charged, uh, unless Betty's worn hers out, which has happened. Drains awesome. a battery in less than a day. So, uh, so, but now what you're focused on is sort of the next shift or wave in container problems and solutions, right? Um, so you joined Solo IO this year. Uh, we, we knew about them for a while as the Docker captains because Docker has been talking about this as sort of one of the next big problems to uh, enhancing our container orchestration and fixing a lot of the, the problems that we've created by putting so many different containers all in a bunch of servers. So maybe uh, starting off, what what is, um, how, why is service mesh even a thing and, you know, like maybe give us some history or something. Yeah, and um, you know, for for those of us like you and me who've been in the container space for a while, kind of since the beginning, um, it's interesting that you know we feel like oh, it's been around for so long, we're so deep in it, like this is the next thing, um, service mesh and all these other um, areas. Um, but when you think about it, Docker just celebrated its sixth birthday. Kubernetes is celebrating its fifth birthday. So um, they're the folks that have been deep in this kind of cloud native and microservices world for a long time. But, um, you know, there's everybody else um, that's not looking at kind of like this is the next um, stage to do this. Um, and I was doing a little thinking about this, um, you know, and part of my reason uh, reasoning for joining Solo as well is that when I even look at my own career, you know, I spent a, uh, a long time at VMware. 
Um, and then I went to Docker and now I'm here. And so in a nutshell, the statement is I really like abstractions. <laughs> yeah, you told I me like that the other day and I like it. I like it. Yeah. Um, and when you think about the abstractions, it's it's interesting because um, it'll kind of explain why mesh is a thing we need to, we need to look at honestly today. Um, is that when we for, when we first started with like, let's say VMware and virtualization. We had a high. We had an application architecture that was, you know, monolithic, and it was highly dependent, right? There's a high level of dependencies, and it, it started out being tied to, you know, you have like the physical box, and then the operating system, and then the applications. Everything was um, had a lot of dependency on itself. When we virtualized, we created one separation, right, from the machine to the OS, and that solved a lot of problems um, for people. They're like, oh my gosh, I get better utilization of the servers. Um, uh, and then I can, you know, I, I can, I can spit, I can provision um, these applications faster than before. Um, but then once we did that, once we now created like logical servers on physical servers, that created a whole slew of problems that, uh, and not necessarily problems, but uh, once you changed how something behaved, it then said, oh, what about this? How yeah. do I then think about things like storage or security? All those same, all those questions. Um, and what I, what was interesting is then. You know, it, VMware has been around for 20 years, um, and over those 20 years, um, VMware and um, their, that ecosystem has been solving a lot of those um, problems and doing more interesting things, right? Once um, things are separated, you can do interesting things. Uh, fast forward to the, you know, about five years I spent at Docker, we just, what we did was create a, yet another separation, but just at a different layer, right? Yeah. And then developers rejoiced. And then um, the, the, uh, a lot of the um, architects and the IT kind of sysadmins and operators said, oh, my gosh, now what? Um, because it changed how because it, it changes how they, um, you know, how they were orchestrating those applications before For, uh, you went from like one, you know, uh, you know, one um, code base. Right. That was kind of deployed as one thing. Challenges that, um, you know, there were pluses and minuses of those um, to then having, you know, my app could be three three containers, or in some cases, like hundreds of containers. Now what? <laughs> right? Um, right. It yeah, used to be a so, monolith, right? Like it was a old, it was a, it was a single binary on a server. And now it's spread over a whole bunch of stuff. Exactly. And the thing is, it's like, now we have this, uh, we have, hun you know, any number of containers as you want, there is no right magic number. It's whatever the um, or application team wants. Um, and then the idea is that like, you can now kind of scale up and down and change those things um, all independently. Like that's the beauty of it. Um, so that's, uh, and then when you look at that, it, you know, as we've all seen in kind of all the questions in the ecosystem, what does that mean for things like state and storage um, and um, networking? When it used to be like, I have a physical thing here and I have a physical thing here, I can just build it in to my business logic. Like they, right. those two are the only things that talk to each other. Those two things are now like a hundred things that are sometimes on, sometimes off, changing all the time. Who talks to what? Um, and that's really where service mesh is born. When you have a highly dynamic environment, your rules on um, does Betty always talk to Brett and then Brett talks to Beth in that order right. changes when uh, Betty's Betty keeps walking around and Brett keeps driving around the city. <laughs> Yeah, like I know when to talk. So now the the way that you're writing those um, rules are different, and that's really um, the concept behind service mesh. Yeah, it, it started the the problem started showing up for me when suddenly this thing that was normally on one server, and I'm going to use a simple <laughs> example like a PHP and a, a Apache app or something, and it was a very large monolithic app, and it was on we had it on a couple of servers, but for redundancy, but it wasn't it was all talking to itself, right? And to troubleshoot, that was largely about talking to, you know, the development team to enable the debug flag in the in the app, so it would just log everything. And then eventually, as those kind of apps became more distributed and, and more focused on microservice architecture type, suddenly I had to care so much more about network tools, <laughs> you yeah. know, because now I I couldn't just go debug the app or load up some sort of performance debugger in the app to figure out what was my performance problem, why was this thing not working. And now suddenly I'm looking at all sorts of system level tools at the Linux level and at the networking level, and I'm trying to figure out how to plug into firewalls. You know, is this port even open and getting there and all these sort of networking things. And on this show, we talk a lot about actually a, a sort of a tool that came out of that called NetShoot, 
uh, made by one of the Docker engineers originally, but it's just a it's a crap ton of low level n- network and systems troubleshooting tools, and I th- and it's a big problem once you get to con- a large scale containers, right? When you have a couple of servers, it's fine, but once you really get to you know dozens and hundreds of containers across dozens and hundreds of servers, it it becomes really difficult to you know deal with the security between these things, right? Do you really want to plug in you know add security features to every single one of your apps? You mm-hmm. know, what do we have to do? How do I make sure that I'm always getting to the right version of my app and the right on the right location and all these other little nuanced issues that you probably don't even realize until you have the system and you're like, okay, this is really hard for me to troubleshoot, you know, measure performance, you know, deal with security and access layers and all that stuff. So, so your story is around like the birth of, of service mesh. And I guess we had, there was on day one, a service mesh, but it seems like now we have all these, (laughs) all these things. Can you talk a little bit about the, like the marketplace? Yeah, and so um, there's the mesh providers in that, um, you know, there's like Istio, HashiCorp Console, there is um, Linkerd by Buoyant, um, AWS um, uh, recently launched App Mesh, which is um, natively inside of, um, you know, the AWS uh, cloud. And then, you know, I, I'd imagine like, I think um, IBM's working on, um, ha- IBM may or may already have or is working on one. Um, so I expect that, you know, when you look at something like Service Mesh, it's really part of like the infrastructure plumbing, but application level infrastructure, right? So there should be um, things that are well integrated into, you know, that stack, that infrastructure stack. Um, but right now it's, um, you know, the pro- some of the projects like Istio is an open source project that comes out of Google, right? Um, the same people behind uh, Kubernetes. And, you know, there, um, there are organizations that are kind of um, taking Istio and then distributing it into their platforms, right? Um, right. You know, like we see with some other open source projects. Um, and then there's, um, you know, like these other ones here. Um, so it's um, there's a lot of providers. Um, each one has a slightly different implementation. Um, I mean, this is all normal for as um, a new market area is forming. Um, and the thing that's really interesting is that um, people will build, you know, with this, you know, the wave of like microservices um, provides so much more flexibility for developers and application teams. When you design your app, you're not starting first with, you can, instead of starting first with like, okay, what is a tech stack that's approved by my company? You can say like, what does my application need to do for the people or the customers that um, I'm building for, right? How they want to interact with it. And then, you know, it could be, you know, hundreds of services, it could be 10 services, um, and it needs to do X, Y, and Z. Um, The beauty of this kind of diversity in the marketplace is you can pick the tool, you can pick that based on um, what your application needs to do. Yeah. Know, Istio is has like tons of um, a, tons of features, but it may not be what um, people need. Linkerd has focused on being very fast and easy to use, um, so that could be good for different types of applications. So really, um, you know, back to like developer choice um, and using the right tool for the job. This allows for that. Um, but um, you know, the problem that when we as a company look at it is uh, we want to help make that process easier. And then we are also like, you'll probably, ha- you may have um, more than one thing in your environment, especially if you're a large, large team. Um, and then um, how do we make that easier for you to kind of operate over time? Yeah. The, um, since there's so much diversity, I mean, so I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, okay, so a lot of us, one, we, we don't even know what service mesh is, or we didn't even know that it was a thing, and we maybe have started to hear about it, and it, it's following the similar pattern to Docker maybe five years ago, right? Like, um, it, if it's six years old as a project, it was, you know, a- after about being about a year old, we, most of us that were just sort of average, you know, pe- people that weren't trying to use the bleeding edge stuff, but we're just trying to get our yeah. job done. We're hearing about this thing called Docker, and we don't really know what it is yet. We read a quick blog article, and we get a gener- we get a basic idea, but we're still very confused about a lot of the things. Um, I feel like we're kind of are we in that stage with with service mesh? Are we we're, we're trying to figure out what it is, what it isn't, and trying to just get people to understand the concept? I think. Um to, uh, in some respects, maybe, because I think it's being uh, more broadly talked about um, kind of in, in like, you know, the last year, 18 months. Um, however, I think it's a little different because um, things like Docker have been around for six years. 
things like Kubernetes has been around for five. And so, yes, some of the bleeding edge folks are kind of deep down that path, um, like the web scale companies have already been using this um, for quite some time. But the body of knowledge that's been kind of from all those com- uh, people's experience over five or six years, um, you know, that lives on the internet as blogs, um, you know, engineering blogs from a lot of companies, samples, demos. Um, and so in that, anybody who's looking at, I'm going to do containers and microservices today, you're not starting at the same place where you and I were starting five years ago. Do you know what I mean? Like there's already been like a, um, a lot of like work and um, application architectures that have been built. And from that, they can look at it with the, you know, it's like hindsight is 2020. You can now look at um, a net new journey for someone containerizing a new microservice or what have you, but um, gaining from the knowledge of everybody who's already gone before. And they're going to ask there, and there's questions on like, how do you handle things like networking and storage and security? Um, A lot of those answers, a lot of those um, kind of questions have already been kind of solved by the ecosystem that has emerged since that time. So they're kind of starting, if you're starting now, you're starting with a bit of a head start compared to where you and I were Um, and even some other uh, companies. Um, And this brings up a good point in that, you know, service mesh as a kind of like uh, market area in cloud native technology is um, relatively new. Right. Um, But I think service mesh as a concept is not new. Um, And, you know, if I look at, you know, when you showed your screen, you know, I had like Netflix on there. Um, I look at companies like the the first company I ever end user I ever talked to when I joined Docker um, was a company called Gilt. You know, they had like Mm. uh, luxury goods that you can buy. It's like the flash sale online. Um, and they had like about five years ago transitioned from like a monolithic app to like over 300 microservices over some period of time. And they made, they got to a point where they're making a hundred changes a day. So like there's, they went from like having like these really, really painful, like day and a half, like I think monthly release processes to, um, a hundred changes a day. Um, and in order to have that, um, hundred changes a day and different customers logging into the site would see different features pop up for them. Right. So they were highly dynamic. Um, you know, they were, they, companies like, um, Guild and companies like Netflix, they had the concept of service mesh. They just all built it from scratch themselves in order to, um, do what they needed to do. Um, what we are experiencing now is the fact that those, um, those things are kind of being productized for everybody else. And they're being like, you know, provided by vendors and like kind of large scale open source projects that can be then picked up by, you know, any company um, to just run themselves and build themselves or vendors to then take and integrate it into other things. And then, you know, provide all the support and all that goodness that we all like to see. Yeah. Um, The I like those uh, well, those stories because they it's hard. I think one of the things that you know, once you learn about service mesh, and it's and it's the same pattern as Docker and Kubernetes, right? Like once we learned about Docker, then we had to make a decision: Do I care? <laughs> and then eventually, <laughs> you're like, okay, everyone yeah. around me is doing this. I need, I, I clear. There's clearly something in the water, and I need to go check this out. Yeah. And and that started to happen with that, that has happened, I think, for a lot of people with Kubernetes. Of course, everyone's on their own path, right? There'll still be people just getting into to orchestration in five years, right? So that's a a thing, but um. With with service mesh for solo I/O, how do you how do you help people understand if they even need it? You know, like if, are, when are they too small or that sort of thing? Yeah, um, I'd say um, it's it's a you know it's the mesh itself is not for like the um, your legacy workloads. It's not something that like if you have workloads today, you're not going to switch all you know you're not going to necessarily switch all of them to a mesh. Um, we may get to that point. That you know that could be interesting to see how the ecosystem evolves, but um, for those folks who are kind of starting their um, thinking about like, hey, we're ready to containerize. We have new applications that we're going to build um, that's going to use containers, um, and that's going to be um, from more of a microservices structure. Um, those folks sh- should think about service mesh, and it's really from the concept of like when I map out my app architecture. You know, I'm going to whiteboard out like here's my here's this new app project. We needed to do this. And you start talking about um, what are the what are the components that we're going to use in here, right? So then they start to think like, oh, we have polyglot, we have different things we're going to try. Then you have containers. Immediately, the next question should be, how are all these things going to talk to each other? What, how are we going to, um, you know, in what order? What kind of policies do we want to have for it? Um, 
if we start to um, update a container, even if you have five containers in your app, you know, you're going to um, roll out an update or if you're going to scale out, um, if you need to scale out certain services um, differently than others, um, you know, how are you going to manage routing the traffic between them during updates, you yeah. know, so that you know that it's good before you, um, you know, send 100% of the traffic. Those are all things that are, those are all like uh, networking questions at the application level that are solved with service mesh. Mm. Um the mesh is like literally if you think of like the mesh and then all your services sit on it and then you can think about and control your network policies separate from, you know, separate from your actual application code. So you're we're creating yet another like, you know, separation. Right. You know, and um, everybody rejoices and then everybody also kind of freaks out. Um but the idea is like you should be able to update and update your code and make changes, deploy new features separate from you know, hey, how should this thing talk to this other thing? And, you know, I have 100 people coming to my website today inbound, like, you know, I'm just rolling out this update. Do I want all 100 people to roll to the new, hit the new thing? Right. Or do I want, or do I want like 10% of them to hit it? And then it, it feels good. I'm not seeing any, you know, like you say, degradation in performance. I'm not getting any errors. So I'll start to then at some rate, send more and more of that traffic. And then I can go kill the other container that is the older code. Right. You know, it's just it's more granular. Um, you know, that's the thing that abstractions do. It creates more things that we need to look at. But the granularity allows you to have more control fundamentally of the environment. It's not like a um, all purpose on off switch anymore. Right. It sounds a little bit like so for people learning in my courses and stuff, they, they learn Docker, Swarm and then Kubernetes and sort of in that order. And, um, you know, each one is more complex and more abstractions than the last. And uh, they get used to having, you know, DNS round robin or load balancing in there as the way that one part of their app finds another part of their app is this sort of simple DNS and simple load balancer concept. And it's, uh, it, mm -hmm. it's usually out of the box. It's very basic, right? It doesn't add a lot of uh, functionality there. So when you start talking about 10% of traffic or, you know, looking at the requests real time in the traffic or, you know, controlling which one can talk to other ones at an application layer level instead of just firewalling things or um, in like Docker and Docker Swarm where you just create little virtual networks and that's sort of like a VLAN. So it sounds like this is like once that's not enough and just simple round robin load balancing isn't there, is that when you should start considering service mesh? Is that kind of the entry ga gateway drug of sorts? I mean, there's a level of, um, for folks, um, there could be like a level of scale and number of services, right? Number of containers. Um, but even when you have, um, in order to even understand the concept of what's built in coming out of the box with like a swar with Swarm or Kubernetes is to say like, based on, um, based on the application, based on who it's serving, based on the SLAs and whatever I need to provide is leaving it all to be completely automated by, um, that system enough, you know? So it's, it is, you know, it's another layer within orchestration. Um, sometimes like that's cool. Um, and sometimes it might be like, I need a few more controls than what's just there out of the box. And it's really about thinking about what are the rules I need? Right. What are right. the policies I need? And then it's like, okay, great. I can do these other things. Very cool. So if, <clears throat> if someone was, uh, so if someone had learned Swarm and, or Kubernetes, it sounds like, uh, at least it looks like that the marketplace is really centering this around the Kubernetes orchestration. So do you, do you sort of consider Kubernetes a requirement before you get into super me super, uh, service mesh? Or is there, I think, I guess, I guess AWS has their own, and I don't even know if that is on Kubernetes or I guess it's on top of EKS. <laughs> Yeah, it works with like EKS and Fargate and those other bits. Um, uh, I think um, I think the HashiCorp stuff actually works with VMs. Um, uh, the other, a lot of the other things right now are Kubernetes based. Um, but yeah. that's you know that's also working with containers. You know, Docker also works with um, works with both. Um, that'd be. I think there's also some playing around that we could do. Yeah, so um, I was looking for like a diagram on Service Mesh, like where it fits in the stack. Some random Google image search. Um, and it, it, as my understanding, it, it t comes in as separate containers for each part of your app. Is that kind of how it's deployed is something that's alongside? Uh, yes. So from an architectural standpoint, if you want a picture, um, it is um, this concept of like sidecar, right? 
Um, and that's what really, um, and that sidecar container runs alongside the actual service, the, the, the container that has your application code, the business logic. And that's what I meant by like abstracting that out. Instead of having that built into like your actual like business logic, it sits alongside. And so when there is a, when the traffic's going through, it's going to, before it hits the container, it's always kind of traveling through that sidecar in and out. And so that's where what gets interesting is like um, when you abstract it out, so you're managing all like the routing and the rules and the policies separately, um, you can, it just allows for more interesting things. You can um, update the, you know, you can update um, the code or update the um, uh, mesh thing separately from each other. So think of another separation of concerns from that point um, and then be able to kind of manage those separately. Right. Uh, I found a random uh, diagram of Itzio. So <laughs> it, it, like most conceptual diagrams, it, it really doesn't make any sense by itself. So usually someone has to explain <laughs> what the heck it means. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and the thing is, it's like uh, a good way to think about like mesh is like the communication that happens within your cluster, yeah. right? All the stuff inside your cluster, it needs to talk a certain way to each other to make sure that the app actually works and the user has the experience that you wanted them to have with the application. And then there's the, there's other kinds of traffic is the traffic coming into your cluster from the outside. That's when somebody actually accesses your service. Yeah. So those are like kind of the two ways to think about that. Yeah. And then uh, service meshes for all the stuff inside your cluster. So um, one of the first, so, if, you know, people that are typically following these videos are very hands on, right? And so one of their first questions is, okay, that's great. Uh, how do I install it? <laughs> well, how could I, how could I look at it? And uh, you told me something about, I think it's a uh, service mesh hub. Is that right? Yes. And so that's the thing that we've put together because we know that like with all new technology, uh, we, it can be, you know, sometimes scary if you haven't like, you know, read everything on the internet before you try and use it. So what we wanted to do is make that whole getting started process super easy um, and making it easy to try different ones. Right. And like we said, there's different options out there. Um, so service mesh hub .io, um, It is a what Brett's showing right now. That is a read only website. So you can see, you know, it's what we're trying to do is put a GUI um, based dashboard in front of all the things that are meshes. So from here, what you can do is if you click on that click here right there, this is a read only environment. But in that click here thing, it'll do a little pop up. Basically, you can install this mesh hub on your own Kubernetes cluster. And then from there, there's the ability to, once it's stood up, you know, very three simple commands, um, what you can, what it'll do is it'll one, automatically um, uh, discover if you by any chance happen to already have meshes running in your environment, because you never know, um, <laughs> your buddy in, your buddy down the hall might already be playing with this. Yeah. Um, separately, um, from here, if you go back to the GUI, you can do, um, install a new mesh from the dashboard. So this dashboard is really kind of like your, your operations hub for it. Um, you can, if you click install a new um, mesh, what it'll do is you can pick like, um, we have Istio and Linkerd, select, um, give it a name, pick your namespace, and it'll install it for you. So the meshes um, that are available, like all have slightly different APIs, they're you know provided by different vendors. What we're trying to do here is instead of you as an end user having to learn the details of each one, you could come here and then we're doing some of that translation for you. And then making things like installation, configuration, seeing what's running on there, all the services you may have deployed to it, um, you know, making that part kind of like uh, unifying that in kind of in one view for you. Yeah. So it, it eases the, we, like all open source projects, especially at the beginning, right? We, we, we focus on feature set and solving problems before we solve the, this is easy to install and deploy and, and use problem. Um, so this is sort of, uh, instead of waiting for any one standard on installing this stuff, you sort of solve that problem for, for people. And this is all free, right? Free to use? This is free to use, yes. So how does this relate? I, I think earlier I showed another one of uh, Solo.io's products, the Superglue. Yeah. How does this relate to that? Yes, so Superglue um, is kind of the, um, this is Service Mesh Hub is kind of like an evolution of Superglue and Superglue is really um, a fundamental building block um, around it. This is all CLI based. This is um, a uh, mesh orchestrator, right? So it's a thing that kind of does the translation and um, kind of orchestrate multiple meshes in a consistent way. What we've done is taken Superglue. Um, it's been an, it's an open, it's a project we open sourced, um, you know, in the fall of last year. 
And then um, as we've kind of kept, um, you know, been talking to users um, and working with the ecosystem, um, we've evolved that and then built on top of it to build the mesh hub mm. is really what it is. And the mesh hub becomes this thing that, um, you know, with um, the, the kind of the point and click UI on it and the, be able to kind of like view all status in a nice um, uh, display, it, I think it makes it more accessible. It makes it accessible to more people. Not everybody's comfortable doing all command line commands and trying to remember all of them. Um, some people want to be able to do a quick snapshot and see like, you know, what's red, yellow, green in my environment, right? Um, mm. Yeah. Plus the icons are cool. Like I, yeah. just, I just, I want to use all the solo products because it, it, it reminds me very much of the Docker, uh, Docker cute stuff. I think, you know, with, um, it's, it's nice to make things fun. Um, and then, you know, I can, how about this, Brett, for everyone you try, we'll just send you another little character guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. You can have a whole it, little family. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Betty sent me this little guy right here. Um, what is that glue? That is glue. Glue. And we haven't talked about, I'm oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was gonna say, we haven't talked about that yet. Glue, yes. So, you know, at the end of the day, when you look at what um, we as a company are doing is we're, at, um, we're working with the application network level. We're working at that layer and we're trying to connect applications so that, um, you know, people can do interesting things with them. And so when we look at that, that we, there are two sides. When you look at the application landscape, you know, all, what kind of apps could you have? One is well, you have a, there's a lot of stuff you already have and then there's stuff you want to build. And so all the stuff we just talked about with Service Mesh Hub is people, when you're looking to build new applications, um, everyone is looking at you know, containers, microservices, and uh, Kubernetes. And that means a new ecosystem of um, stuff around it, and of, of which Service Mesh is an enabling kind of architectural component. And then there is you know, the loads and loads of applications that have been running, you know, your business for a really long time. Um, a lot of them might be monoliths and those need to, um, you know, you still need to iterate on them. You still need to deliver new features. So with that side is, um, on that side, we have an API gateway. And so we're helping kind of connect, um, evolve those applications on their journey to becoming, um, you know, more cloud native um, by using the API gateway to help add new features to an existing app, you know, um, that's outside of the monolithic code base and using an API gateway to help route those requests um, coming in from um, coming in uh, from your from your customers into the right um, feature set. Yeah, and uh, I guess we should reiterate that this this is about uh, technically I guess it would be called greenfield greenfield apps microservice apps and that it's not. Uh, unlike just containers in general that can run everything, because that's a question we get a lot is, what do I not put in containers? But I think at this point, generally, uh, every workload should default to a container. And if you can figure out how to, you know, it's usually just an environment variable thing or something like that. It's not uh, very little code that has to be changed. I think PayPal talks about, and their, their, their container story about replacing or updating hundreds and hundreds of apps to run in containers and that they didn't have to change any code for that. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so, so legacy apps can still run in containers and can still run on Kubernetes, but it seems like you're talking about that really it's, it's the distributed microservice architecture that really needs something like a service mesh to, to help manage it, right? Yeah. And so, um, the service mesh is great for Greenfield, right? Because it's, um, you know, that's the one where you'll have like more than one service. Right. And you'll start and then they will scale it in different ways and you'll want to be more um, granular on how you kind of control that. Right. Um, and then the when we when you kind of went over to the um, the glue aspect, that's like, you know, if you convert your, you know, convert your legacy workload into like a, a big container and say, you, you know, you're you're going to keep it around. Right. But you want to add a feature to it. You could add a feature, um, new feature as a function. Um, or you can turn that one container into two, and then you need to start um, being able to manage those connections between them. Right. Um, and so uh, one of the questions Alexandra asks, how to set up service mesh on Docker Swarm? And I don't know if Betty has a better answer than I do, but I think right now I don't know of any oh. service mesh that works out of the box with Swarm. And I think one of the more challenging issues with it is that the service me all the service mesh features aren't built into your app. They're built as a sidecar or a separate container. Now, with Kubernetes, you get pods out of the um, out of the architecture. You know, of, of Kubernetes, you get this 
functionality where a pod can be mi multiple containers all deployed to the same server. You know, they both they all have the same networking and volume space. But in Swarm, we don't have that pod concept. We it sort of is removed from the stack to increase simplicity. And so you just really have the load balancer with built-in DNS round robining and load balancing. So service mesh, I, I, I know that there's captains that are playing around with it, but I don't know that anyone who's got a really good demo, and of course, feel free to Google and prove me wrong because <laughs> I, I did not Google before the show. Um, yeah, I think, um, I think uh, Chanwit had a comment recently about Swarm and then using... Um, you know, because the captains do love to hack away and try interesting things. Right. Uh, I think he was playing around with um, with uh, Swarm and some of the some of our open source technology to see can, if he can like build the concept of like a uh, service mesh into it. Um, but yeah, the Swarm comes with like you said. Um, that's probably the the built in kind of like just the routing mesh, which is kind of like a you know like the round robining, um, just to kind of make sure the traffic gets to the right place. Um, but that's also yeah, it's not separate. Yeah. Like mesh. Yeah, in fact, I'm uh I, I remember this uh reading this uh, recently about the people asking for Docker Swarm support in Itzio and um I think there's just part of the challenge is I think that people generally, you know, Swarm is a a more enclosed, you know, it's a single binary, right? So to add functionality unlike with Kubernetes where there's all these moving parts and all these different layers, um, that increases flexibility and allows you to add these different layers of technology into your solutions. Whether with Swarm, it's ch unless it's supported out of the box or there's a specific plugin or something for it, it, it gets challenging to to make it work. So I think right now, I mean, the thing is, is like the future. Who knows what's going to happen in the future, right? Uh, Docker announced a whole new set of stuff for the enterprise platform around service mesh, and we don't really have specifics on that yet. But um, you know, I think if anyone, if if anyone wants you know, service mesh and swarm hard enough, uh, go find these issues. Like just Google around and find these issues, and give your thumbs up to show that you would like to have the simplicity of swarm with also the benefits of service mesh. Because I, um, I think it's a right now it tends to be, tends to be a maturity model, right? You mm -hmm. you adopt Docker swarm, and then you get to a level where you're like. Uh, we want Envoy. We want Service Mesh. We want, um, all, you know, we want all these. We want Helm charts. We want all these other things that Swarm doesn't get support for, and so that forces people to try out Kubernetes. Then they adopt and mm -hmm. learn Kubernetes, and now they have these new features available to them, rather than you know, and people just want to get work done. So they're not going. I'm going to go make a Service Mesh that works with Swarm, <laughs> <laughs> because I have a need in my job. Not everyone can have has that luxury. Of course, some people do, mm -hmm. and that's how these projects get started. <laughs> but uh, but not everybody can do that. So I think we're early. I think I'm not saying that service mesh would never be in Swarm. I think we're just too early days with service mesh for Swarm because the the people that adopt Swarm are in my for my consulting and like t talking to people, they just want to get work done rather than uh, play with leading edge technology. And so Swarm out of the box, that's one of its key features. Is it's just easy to get started, and but that also means it's not going to have every feature. That you could possibly imagine, which is, I think, where the realm of Kubernetes. Yeah, you know, I mean, we've got 80 plus projects now on how just to deploy apps on Kubernetes. So we've got a lot of experimentation, and I think that um, you know, when I hear about a, a service mesh for Swarm, you will definitely be hearing about it from me because I'll be I'll be talking about it. We'll be showing it on this show. We'll have Betty back in. Woohoo! Yeah, because um, I want to say at DockerCon, um, I did see they did announce that they were going to be supporting Istio. In yeah. um, the enterprise suite, but um, I don't. I haven't seen any more details on that either. So it'd be interesting to see how that's going to play out with the fact that they support both Swarm and Kubernetes inside um, the platform together, yeah. like side by side. How that will play with Istio support? Yeah, and I think um, I, I thought the exact same thing when I saw it on the slide and announced at DockerCon. I thought, okay, because by default you're still deploying Swarm out of the box with Docker Enterprise, although it doesn't really have a strong opinion. You can turn on Kubernetes, turn, mm -hmm. on, turn on Swarm, have both. Both of those work with Enterprise. But uh, I immediately thought, OK, does that mean we're going to get some like bonus plugin features for Swarm to uh, you know, to get support for Itzio? Because it would be great for the Swarm. That, you know, Swarm team would be the best people to work on that, because they know Swarm so well. Um, the, I think one of the things, though, with Swarm is even though I don't see Swarm ever getting pods, at least not, there's no, there's no discussion on the roadmap of adding pod support. We could probably figure out something around constraints so that you could ensure that your um, 
basically you can ensure that that service mesh sidecar is always running with your app container. And mm -hmm. we just need a couple of extra features in Swarm uh, mode. And if, you're, if you've been around long enough, if there's anyone on the chat that's been around long enough, there was this old Swarm called Swarm Classic. And it actually supported that. It had a feature in it that allowed you to run a container and basically it would find the right other container to run side by side with it. And it wasn't technically a pod. It just meant that it would always be on the same server together. Mm -hmm. And if we got that support back, we might be able to get something like that. I'll have to bring that up with the captains and see if we can't hack away or something like that. And, I, and I'm not sure Chenwitz, um, I couldn't find his tweet, but uh, I know he's been talking about it lately. And let me just send people to that on Twitter. Um, so what are some more common questions that you you get from people on, you know, like, what are they on service mesh? Like, what are what are the, or where, where do the solo uh, products fit into their problem set? I mean, so I get two sets of questions, and it really falls into, like, how deep are they down, kind of like the um, rabbit hole with uh, the cloud native technologies, right? So I get people who are like, they may have already like our founder um, has been um, speaking at a lot of conferences um, and people have been familiar with some of the projects. Um, so they're like, oh yeah, I was already using Superglue to kind of play around because um, we're looking at mesh. We've already done, we've already done blah, 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 right? And so now we're like before, in order to kind of like set up the rest of the environment, we are gonna um, go into mesh. And so, you know, they, they always say like, we're playing with both Istio and Linkerd. I'm like, okay, great. And so we're playing around. And then it really comes down to like, um, you know, Istio does a ton of things. It's kind of like Kubernetes. It does a ton of things. So how much of it do you need? Um, uh, Linkerd does um, what it does really, really well. And it's like, is that is that is that what you need, or do you need a few other things from over here? You know, that's really the question. So the the questions kind of come into like, hey, we do a bunch of this stuff. Um, so they'll have either like deep mesh related questions, or it's um, well, it is a mesh. <laughs> you know, or I'm looking at Istio. And then it's like, what? Uh, oh, for what? We're like, I don't know. I heard I need to look at mesh. So we're definitely there's um, there's a lot of people like it's it's a buzzword kind of you know we had the whole container buzzword like years ago. Um, so it's really in those two camps. And then when it comes to like um, I need X, I'm looking at X because I heard I need to look at it. It's really kind of going back to like, hey, what are the what are the things that you guys are doing? Are you doing microservices? Do you have one in plan? Have you already implemented containerization? You know at some point, are you using it at all? Um, because those become um, the leading questions into, hey, how are you architecting for the container environment for your microservices? And have you thought about all these other things? And that's really when the discussion around like, you know, um, do you wanna be using service mesh come in? Yeah. Yeah. There's- um, Which is exactly like this question that you're showing on screen here. Yeah, it was very timely. Thank you, Michael. Yes. Um, uh, I'm looking on Solo IO for the project list. Is it maybe on the Go open source to, page? We have an open source. open source tab. Yeah. Yeah. And because um, it 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 seems like uh, you know you all are find like finding a rough like a, a thing that Service Mesh either is not doing well out of the box and it needs help with it, or something cool that you can do on top of Service Mesh. To, to add even more functionality or insight into your apps. So that seems where um, either that or you're just wanting to make up really cool characters and so you, you're making open source. So let's run, let's run through the hits real quick because uh, as someone uh, wants to consider service mesh, I feel like they should check this stuff out first because it'll make it easier to deal with service mesh in, in the beginning and like how to get it started and so. Yeah, so yeah. Um, our whole thing um, with all of our projects um, and what we're doing with our with the company is, um, you know, Adit's vision is like, you know, the we want to help people um, get to the get to um, get to microservices, get get to this um, the land of like, you know, I have these apps that I can deploy faster. Like the promise of microservices is to be more agile, to be to be faster, and then to have um, more freedom for your developers, right, in their creativity on how they build these applications. You build your app with the best things for the job. So we want to help people get there. And so um, when you look at that, um, Glue is um, on the left there is the um, API gateway. So that's really about like helping transition that monolith to be more cloud native because you can start to add, you can um, kind of iteratively add capabilities to it. And the new capabilities can come in the form of microservices or like serverless functions. 
we call that concept a hybrid app. So it's really about, you know, how do we help you route, um, uh, you know, add capabilities and route traffic on things that are not using mesh today. Um, squash is, um, this is another thing on like, you know, microservices are great, but when you kind of change um, something um, dramatically like that, the whole tool set around how you deal with microservices hasn't evolved. So people are like, when you have a, when you have a bug in your, let's say hundred service microservice, how do you know? Yeah. How do you debug it? And where, which service where is it that has it? the problem? <laughs> right. Yeah, what is it? And, um, you know, what language is like running inside of that container? You polydoc poly polyglot development, right? Um, so um, this is, Squash is a um, language agnostic debugger. Um, and so what it's doing is it'll like, you know, scan your environment to say like, you know, all the running pods and services and containers. And then you can say like, I'm going to attach a debugger to this one because this is the one that has the problem. And then it can open up even in, um, open up your native um, IDE, right? Um, if needed. Um, if you scroll down, Superglue, we talked about that. Um, that's really service mesh orchestration. Um, so we see like Glue and Superglue, um, Superglue is an open source project behind um, Service Mesh Hub, but we see the Glue thing and the Service Mesh Hub, service mesh hub being being like two sides of the coin, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. And then um, Glue Shot, um, this was something we announced just at uh, KubeCon Europe, but that's really um, starting to think about if you have a mesh, if you have your application network abstracted away from your code, uh, what kind of interesting things can you do? Um, this concept of chaos engineering um, is that if you have start to have applications that are lots of services, the network, like you mentioned, becomes more important, right? How those things talk to each other is really critical to um, uh, troubleshooting the app, finding out what's going on. So once you start having a lot of services and um, those services are all being updated by different people at different times, how will you know where weak points are? So this is about, you know, almost thinking about it from like proactive testing, like the whole idea of testing applications changes when you have microservices. So Glue Shot, what that does, it injects failures. You can con build controlled experiments. You can inject um, failures or latency through the sidecars and then um, be able to see how what happens and then if you start to see things like it's controlled in that you could turn it off as you're monitoring like what's happening in that environment but the whole idea is like you inject these things to see like um, how they behave where some like weak points or stress are um, in your application environment and then you can debug them before that kind of issue actually happens um, you know in production like yeah. right to, a, to a customer accessing your app that's pretty cool that i mean that's the kind of thing that i feel like uh the only if you didn't have a service mesh, the only other way to do something that at that level of your app is to either, I guess, have completely software defined networking or uh, put this into your app directly, like custom code it. Um, mm -hmm. So this so the uh, glue shot is for it's it's augmenting the service mesh or is it augmenting it's it's not in your app right it's in it's in the service mesh it's augmenting um, it's using the service mesh to yeah. do this. Um, and you um, you explained it really well in that if you didn't have that, you'd be like importing libraries or actually making code changes. Um, so then you have problems with like, um, you're building more dependencies in there, right? Um, and then if you're, you know, if you, if, if how you do the experiment things, uh, the tools you're using those change, then do you have to update your whole application? Um, you know, the, the separating those out um, kind of give you a little more flexibility on how to handle that. Yeah, cool. Yeah, Glucia. and then the scoop scoop is GraphQL, so you have the ability to do it in a no code way to kind of like scoop different data sets together. Um. Yeah, um, very cool. And um, we have a question in chat, a little technical one um, from Biker. Uh, Biker asks about uh, he says they're concerned about chatty protocols at his office, so. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've never measured this, the service mesh traffic to actually look at what it's generating. I don't actually know what is the back end of service mesh. Is it storing data just in etcd? Do you know? Yeah, um, there's a, there's a, yeah, I believe so. And this is something that actually comes up a lot, um, question-wise, because of the fact that, you know, now we start talking about like, oh, now every service has a sidecar. Oh, right. my God. And, we just and then, you just doubled the amount of containers on your network. Yeah. Yeah, and, um, you know, one, if you 
anytime you're doing this, you, you should always test. Make sure you always test. <laughs> test it, um, test the performance and see how it behaves. Cause some of it will may, some of it might be uh, traffic related. Some of it might be just, uh, it could be, um, it could point to like your network infrastructure, um, not the application network layer. Um, and then also it could um, point out some other areas and how your application business logic might be handling some things. So, um, it's, it's worth testing. Um, however, I'm going to say like, you know, major like things that you use every day, use this type of architecture, things that you as a consumer expect to be using on your phone. And it's processing a lot of, um, data to get you a car, you know, like to your doorstep to get right. you things delivered, those things. And those are really happening very, very quickly. So when you think about that, like this works, but like with all other things that are network dependent, you will have to um, set it up, test it and performance tune it likely. Right. You know, so when you look at this and you look at some, um, uh, you know, some of the, um, some of the meshes, like, you know, there's varying levels of complexity and there's varying things that you can use within them. You don't need to have all of them on. If that's not, if those are not capabilities that you need for the application environment. Right. Like if it was, um, if it was maybe a video uploading or video streaming service, you might not have those major endpoints that are transferring all that high end data, like large amounts of data that maybe doesn't go directly through a service mesh because at the end it's, it's a proxy, right? Like, so one of the concerns is if I'm adding proxies <laughs> and so, someone at DockerCon that I keep quoting is basically orchestration is turning into just a bunch of proxies. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so you got proxies all the way down, proxy, 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 proxy. And um, that, yes, that, that adds, that definitely adds delay and feedback. But th what's crazy is that we are, we're uncomfortable with the idea generally, and this is a good thing. I mean, engineers are generally uncomfortable with the idea of adding another layer of abstraction or another layer of networking or hop uh, until we start doing it, and then we realize, oh, we're fine 99% of the time. Like, uh, if you looked at uh, Docker Swarm with the overlay networking, um, and I haven't talked about this publicly because it's changed lately, and I wanted to, so I'm going to throw this in there as a soapbox. We uh, we didn't we didn't a lot of people weren't real, were really concerned about the fact that overlay networking, the concept of it is it's using the the Linux container or the uh, the Linux kernel to route your networking and essentially create a new abstraction where it's encapsulating your packets. So when you start telling this to people, they start to, they're really uncomfortable at first because they're like, what, you're putting my TCP packets in UDP packets and sending around the network? And then they use it and the benefits are so outweighing that 5% you know, performance degradation that they're like, okay, well, I'm just gonna make faster networking. I'll use 10 gigabit instead of one gigabit or something like that. Yep. And um, in fact, on Microsoft's website, this is the thing that I figured out recently. Uh, for Swarm, uh, M Microsoft has Azure documentation for implementing all the, you know, the orchestrators and stuff like that. And for the longest time, their Swarm page uh, talked about not using overlay in production because the overlay networking style, where it encapsulates these packets, uh, has a performance hit. And so they would caution you against using it in production. And instead of, I, I would argue that they need more people need, need more information to make that decision. They need to know. Like, does my does it matter if there's five percent performance hit on my on my app and stuff like that? But now what they've done is uh, Kubernetes is starting to get overlay networking, overlay mesh networking in the exact same way as Swarm. And Windows just in the last couple of months has got this new uh, op feature out of the box to allow this uh, overlay networking at, at lower level, level level than service mesh would be. But do, but Microsoft has taken that statement out of their documentation, so that <laughs> now it's acceptable to them to use overlay yeah. networking and that a layer of abstraction, because they're finding that oh yeah if it's if you're doing web services it's fine right if you're doing video uploads maybe not right like if you're saturating ten gigabit network connections maybe not but uh, they're I think they're they're they themselves have to get comfortable with a layer of abstraction and that idea. And this is, I think, just the next level, right? This is the next yeah. step of that, where we're, we're now having to get comfortable with the idea that we're going through a bunch of proxies, but those proxies add so much richness to yes. our systems that it's worth the hit, yeah. Yeah, and so then it's like, what else do you change so that um, you can kind of offset that hit, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, uh, and it's also the whole, there's a, there's a quote around, you don't have a performance problem until you have a performance problem. So, you know, <laughs> People, people will chew up networking all day long until they hit a limit, and then suddenly, okay, now we have to troubleshoot performance because we have this, you know, and that makes 
makes you upgrade servers or make better code or find a you know fix a bug in someone else's code or whatever. Um, and I think that's largely what this will also do, right? It like like Betty's saying, it it probably will expose some things that you didn't even realize in your app. Um, in fact, in our, our workshops, especially in Jerome Petazoni's workshops, um, you do a little bit of basic network troubleshooting to understand latency between um, containers. And he actually throws in little latency bugs into the mm -hmm. demos so that you see like, oh, this only took 100, this took 100 milliseconds and this other one took one millisecond. That's weird. And when you're using it, it acts fine. But then you eventually realize that you, you hit a cap in your performance and like you can't yep. take more connections and you have to trace that down. And I imagine eventually he will probably have a service mesh and debugger <laughs> feature set on top of that. We're like, well, what if you had these tools? It would be so much easier than curl and ping. <laughs> so you know, we just chatted the other day. Um, actually, he has a um, he put out an interesting blog post talking about because um, he was, you know, he's been doing like Docker and Kubernetes for so long. Um, and he was exploring into like just mesh as a, con you know, in general. And his blog post recently talked about like in the days that before Docker was Docker and it was dot cloud as a PaaS, um, all the things that they built themselves. Yeah. And it was basically, they built the concept of service mesh. Um, they custom built it. Um, and he's kind of like, oh, and then, and then let me, you know, because you needed it for what they were building. Um, and then he's like, okay, now if we like look at that concept and see like what's coming out on the market today. Yeah. Yeah. So it's back to like, you know, you got microservices, you need to start, you know, you want to have more than one service. You need to start thinking about um, uh, how those things are talking and how you want to control that. And that is basically um, how, you know, when you think about it, is your, you know, app network, which is more like mesh. Yeah. Well, okay, so we're uh, hitting an hour on the stream, and uh, let's take the last question. So Fran gets the 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 winner of the last question award. Uh, do you think that is a good idea to migrate a production Docker Swarm to K8s using a Glue API gateway to make the transition, or is it not possible to send traffic to a Swarm? Hmm. You can send you can send traffic to a Swarm as long as like the APIs of um, the API um, that you're using is supported um, by Glue. Yeah. So it's, um, Glue isn't like, uh, yes, Kubernetes knows Docker Swarm. It's not that. Um, we know we support, um, we work with um, all different types of, um, you know, application workload types, you know, uh, containered um, functions um, and monoliths. It's really on um, the APIs that the application can talk on. Yeah. So publish those ports in your Swarm and it just becomes like another endpoint, right? Like Yeah. And then Glue um, can discover them. And also do things like transformations and stuff. So that's the thing. Um, you know, we've got like uh, REST, SOAP, WebSocket, gRPC. All the, all the things container native. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, this has been uh, like, I, there's so much more for me to learn about Service Mesh. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure we're going to have more conversations about it. Uh, we, if, you, if you follow this channel, by the way, we both have a friend, Lee Calcote, who was on the show weeks ago, maybe a month ago, and he was at Kubernetes, a uh, KubeConf, uh, Cloud Native Conf, and he did a session on talking about all the different service meshes. So uh, definitely look for that and look for his talk coming out of KubeCon because that uh, will help give you an intro on that. And um, also check out, uh, you know, basically there's courses coming for me and I'm not saying that there will or will not be service mesh here anytime soon but follow <laughs> follow follow us on the Twitters and you will hear about that over there that's over there and um, because I, I think that as you start to adopt more microservice stuff I think it's this is going to be more and more important for us and Betty and Solo IO are helping us understand what is service mesh when do we need it like and what you know, solving the problems of getting it installed and that kind of stuff. And I love it. I love, that's why one of the reasons I rant about Swarm all the time is because it just makes getting started so much easier than, than having to learn huge, complicated products. And so I like easy because um, we, we all, we all want to do the new stuff. And when you make the new stuff easy, that's, I think, how a lot of people really want to use it. So, so Betty, uh, where can we find you online? And Right there, solo.io, um, solo.io from a company website. And then you've got um, my Twitter handle at the bottom there. So please, you know, um, DMs are open too. So just ask me anything. 
Yep, yep. There, there's no bad so, so service mesh question on Twitter, but uh, in case you don't want it to be in public, uh, DM, we both have open DMs so that you can uh, ask those questions that you're not quite wanting to share with the world. And um, Betty, where will you be next? I know you go to conferences and you're, yes. you have a travel schedule. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So actually, um, everybody on the team has been doing tons of, um, we've been, you know, doing webinars, we're going to start doing some of these like live um, types of, um, you know, unboxing and, you know, Q&A type stuff. Um, and we have people speaking at various meetups and conferences. So next week, uh, myself and uh, Scott Cranton will be out in New York City. So we're going to be at QCon. And then we'll also be at the New York City Kubernetes uh, meetup. And then uh, Christian Posta, who's our field CTO, is going to be in D.C. area. So he's speaking at a the Kubernetes like uh, happy hour, all things Kubernetes happy hour meetup. And then also going to be speaking at a, uh, a Red Hat conference. So check our events page like we are going everywhere. Wow. So, and we're happy to talk to you um, and kind of explain, explain and whiteboard and um, help you understand how to think through some of these things as you as you investigate. Yeah, I was getting ready to ask that that, that that question that you don't know the answer to. You're ner- you're nervous that someone's going. I don't have a good answer to that. Was is do you have a single page that you can just send people to for Why, yes, where to do. where to meet you all? And uh, yeah, and there's a lot. Ooh, our first online meetup is going to be next week. Very excited about that to get our community going. And um, so yeah, check us out here and um, sign up, and then um, we'll see you online. Yeah, and that's. How to how to get the real info on service mesh? So thank you so much, Betty, for joining. Uh, this has been a, a great learning experience for me. Uh, just meeting with your team this week and talking about uh, service mesh in general and how Solo IO is trying to help make that easier. And I will certainly have you back on this show because we've got to get our selfie. By the way, I don't think we got a live selfie. Oh, I mean, we need to do that. Yeah. So Betty and I have this thing where we do a, a, a selfie inception. We're going to claim uh, claim the, the copyright on that. Uh, <laughs> Are so we doing this right now, Selfie Brett? inception. Inception. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thanks, everyone, for having Thanks, me Betty. on. Thanks, Betty. All right. I see you about every next week. Thursdays, we'll be back here on YouTube Live. <laughs>